be that we started the presentation with... Oh, there we go, superheroes, and now we're back to superheroes. So about three years ago, I moved to Toronto. A friend of mine came by my apartment and gave me this book by Andrew Kaufman uh, called All My Friends Are Superheroes, and it's a story about this guy, Tom. I don't know if anybody's read it before, but he's basically surrounded by all these people who are superheroes, but he's not, so he feels a little bit overwhelmed by all of it. It's kind of weird for him. So I thought it would be completely appropriate to start my talk with it because a lot of my friends are designers, and I feel really weird about it. Um, so we have the toy maker, Alana Bonari, who we uh, saw earlier on, uh, Jana Badovanak, who's over there, the unicorn. I like to call him, uh, the once a soldier, Craig Allen Smith, of the Mac Mirror, Orange, uh, Claire Orange, whatever, she's in the back there. So I could really sympathize with uh, Tom in the book because, well, all my friends seem to be designers, but I'm not. So who am I? I'm a chemical engineer. Uh, I don't really know what that means, but I did spend five years learning how to build, design, and operate weird things like this. It's an oil refinery. I can tell you by the end of it, I absolutely did not want to do this. Um, so I, <laughs> right? I, I did the most obvious thing. Um, which was a uh, uh, run away as far as I could from something like this. And I, 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 did, I, I bought a plane ticket to Moscow. I, I jumped on the Trans-Siberian Express, and I, I ended up in Mongolia, where I ended up accidentally buying two horses and disappearing into the central Arkhangai province on a photo documentary mission, which made absolutely no sense. Um, but that's where everything fell apart. I was in this bizarre place. Uh, I, 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 I absolutely didn't know anyone, obviously. Um, but... I was totally inspired. This was a really inspirational place. Um, okay, here we go. We need a little bit of notes here. But after surviving a revolution, being thrown off my horse about a half dozen times, and eating everything from goat's eyes to horse milk, I left with three full journals of writing and a case of enteric colitis that nearly killed me in the mountains. But most importantly, the realization how you could take someone out of their environment and completely change them by just changing the environment around them. So I came back to Canada with that in mind, and I found myself in the position of about $105,000 courtesy of the Canadian government to go back to school and do a PhD, which is really weird. It was not what I was planning to do. But I decided to take them up on the challenge, and I, 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 I searched high and low, and I kept ending back at Toronto. And it was really weird because I hated Toronto. I was from Montreal. But I came anyways, ended up in this building. Uh, the, 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 I don't even know what it's called. The Donnelly Center for Cellular and Biomolecular something Research. I don't know what that means, but it's absolutely gorgeous. If you've never seen it before, it's a 160 college. Please go inside. There's lots of bamboo forests. It's absolutely beautiful. But this is an amazing collaborative space. Um, I'm inspired by it daily. Uh, the folks inside, they're changing biology on a daily basis. Just like this lady did about 60 years ago, Henrietta Lacks, but she did so completely unwittingly when doctors took a biopsy sample of her cervical cancer and started growing it in a laboratory. She eventually succumbed to that cervical cancer, but the interesting thing is that it started the cell line that became the basis of biology as we know it today, uh, revolving around her cells. Her cervical cancer cells is really weird. But this has led to huge studies in cancer biology, stem cell research, genomics, tissue engineering, led to the development of the polio vaccine. Just to let you know how really popular this is, there's 50 million tons of her cervix in the world today. That's really bizarre. I, I find it disgusting, in fact. But, but, but really, that, that is the case. And so what do we do with these cells? Well, we, we, we take them, and we put them onto these two-dimensional surfaces. So just these flat plates. They're generally made of polystyrene. Anybody here who's familiar with that is just plastic. It's not too exciting. But then they grow, and they proliferate, and then we can do weird things to them. We can stain their DNA blue. We can make the edges of the cells look red, and it can make beautiful pictures, and it can show them off to people like you, uh, <laughs> but, but this is the cool thing. So if I take cells, stem cells for example, and I move them away from plastic dishes, so this here is a graph of decreasing squishiness, uh, the least squishy being plastic, and I put them on something that simulates the brain, uh, they actually start turning into neurons. These exact same cells will turn into neurons. If I put them onto something that simulates bone, they'll start turning into bone cells. So these cells are actually accumulating information from their environment and changing what they're doing. So this led me to the question, which becomes fundamental to my thesis, hopefully, um, uh, that life is in three dimensions, so why the hell am I studying biology in two dimensions? You know, it, it absolutely didn't make any sense. Look at these brilliant photos. Oh, this is a heart, and that's me. Um, and, <laughs> and so what I decided to do is I'm very envious of all my designer friends, so I want to design for these cells. I want to do weird things. So I, I go to these yellow rooms where I make little devices. And I make these little devices so that I can manipulate tiny droplets of liquid. And when I mean tiny, I mean super tiny, like one mil... No, wait. Yeah, one millionth of a liter. That's like a thousandth of a million 
be a milliliter. So you can't do that with a teaspoon or anything. It's, it's really small. Um, so this is, this is what I made right here. And I make cool pictures of it. Um, I can take a droplet. I can manipulate it across the surface, which is a bunch of electrodes. And I move these droplets using electric fields. It's freaking awesome. Uh, and, and then I can build little structures. So if you see on the right side there, it's imperfect. But that's, that makes it more realistic. I can make these, these three-dimensional structures. And then I can show off. And to get a good publication, you really have to show off. So I can make all these different shapes. I can make stars. I can make hearts. I can make triangles, whatever the hell that is. A diamond, I think. And, and, and I can make all these different architectures for cells. And these are pictures of them in three dimensions. I shoot lasers. I get these three-dimensional images. What's really cool, though, is I take those exact same cells that I showed you earlier on, and I can suspend them in 3D. So this here is an awesome image. of focal laser microscopy. No big deal. Uh, but, <laughs> but I can suspend them in 3D, and you can actually see they, they start growing. Day 1, day 2, day 3, day 4. They start forming these structures. So before they were growing in two dimensions, and now all of a sudden they're forming these structures. These are the exact same cells. Remember, they, they grew like this on a plastic plate, but now I put them into jello in three dimensions, and they start forming structures. This is genetically programmed into these cells to respond to their environment. So that kind of, I think, brings me close to uh, my conclusion because I have two take-home messages here. Sensitivity. So number one, your biology and your psychology are inherently sensitive to your environment. And these are two things that multi-scale, multi-dimensional design should really exploit because this is something that's inherent to your genetic material. You respond and you change to your environment. And I can't say that enough. And this has led to a second huge concept, which now recently came up in biology, especially within the field of neuroscience, um, about plasticity. You're constantly changing. Nothing is what it seems it is. It's constantly changing. And this is a concept of plasticity. We have the ability to form, deform, and reform constantly. So my big like message, what I take home from my travels, what I take home from my lab every day at midnight after I'm miserably sitting there, is that surround yourself by things that you love. Surround yourself by things that inspire you daily. Because really, these are the things that are going to decide your fate. These are the things that, that are going to make you who you are and what you want to be. So with that, uh, I guess I, I thank you all for your time. Cheers. <laughs>